In 1938, five German scientists embark on an extraordinary quest, risking their lives on the crossing of the highest mountains in the world to reach the forbidden kingdom of Tibet. Their official goal is scientific research, zoology and anthropology. But the data they are collecting for the SS is to serve a darker purpose. Their secret mission is to discover the origins of the Aryan peoples. They are to search for signs of a long-vanished master race, whose traces are believed to remain on the roof of the world. This is the zenith of Nazi attempts to rewrite history. A new past would justify their right to change the future of the world. The SS was set up to guard Hitler, but in time it set out to steal history itself, to seize buildings and ideas from other cultures, to construct a new idealized Nordic past. I think the German-Tibet expedition is a very important event in the history of the Third Reich. Many people see the SS purely as a political organization, as a genocidal organization, sending scientific expeditions uh, uh, to various parts of the world, and in particular to Tibet, was one very important way in which prestige was given and added to the SS. 1933, Hitler seizes power. A new German flag flies, a mystical emblem from early Europe. The swastika reflects Nazi belief that Germany is rooted in pagan Nordic tradition. The Germans are the purest representatives of a vanished master race, the Aryans. This gives them the right to rule over lesser races and to retake land where Aryan remains can be found. Heinrich Himmler, the SS leader, is a passionate promoter of the new mythology. His SS is the vanguard of a new racial aristocracy. Its men are to embody and provide the ideas that will give scientific credibility to a new world order. In 1935, in a villa in the Berlin suburb of Dahlem, he sets up the Arnhem Erbe, or Ancestral Heritage Foundation. Even at the height of Nazi rule, its existence is scarcely known. Its aim, to advance the scientific study of the Aryan races and their origins. To reinforce links with the Germanic past, Himmler creates new sites. He erects an avenue of tombstones to commemorate Saxons executed by Charlemagne. They were the victims of a Christian final solution designed to end their pagan ways. Himmler deeply resents Judeo-Christianity. The twig of the German oak has been grafted onto a cedar of Lebanon instead of the ancestors of the Germans. The Jewish patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, have been foisted onto us. To show the Germans their true traditions, he films lavish reconstructions. The Ananaber's motto is a people live happily in the present and the future so long as they are conscious of their past and of the greatness of their ancestors. Hitler has set us the goal for our generation to be a new beginning. He wants us to return to the source of the blood, to root us again in the soil. He seeks again for sources of strength that have been buried for 2,000 years. Signs from the past live again as symbols of the new age. The old Germanic sign for victory, the Sieg Ruhm, becomes the SS insignia created by Himmler. Chief of police, murderer and mystic. Using slave labor from a concentration camp, he reconstructs Wewelsburg Castle a golden 12-spoke sunwheel will be the center of the new world. 
The SS is to be a noble order of warriors sworn to the Führer, modeled on the knights of the past. Wevelsburg is to be the new Camelot. Himmler sees himself as the high priest of a sacred order. He will endorse a new version of the past. From the Stone Age to the Middle Ages, clues will be found to fit an alternative view. World history will be entirely rewritten. His position as Reichsführer gives him the power to make this happen. The scholars of the Ancestral Heritage Foundation will furnish the evidence to change the myths Himmler believes in into accepted history and science. After the war, the building disappears and with it, knowledge of the whole institution. Only when academic Michael Cater carries out research decades later does Himmler's office reappear from oblivion. The historian has no doubt about Himmler's intentions. What he wanted to do there was to realize his own uh, scientific, or rather pseudo-scientific interests and have people work on certain questions which interested him and then utilize them either for his own pleasure or, or for the greater good of the SS or for the greater good indeed of, uh, of Nazi Germany. Himmler begins by charging the Ahnenerbe with finding remnants of Germany's glorious past. German archaeologists have excavated Troy, Mycenae and Babylon. Now they are to unearth the glories of Aryan prehistory. Woe betide them if they fail to discover traces of the master race. By promoting the study of early history, or prehistory as it was then known, Himmler tried to make his wild idea of a superior master race more real. He supported projects intended to prove that the Germans were pioneers in all areas, at every level. Hitler shows nothing but scorn for the whole idea. As if it weren't enough that the Romans were constructing great buildings when our ancestors were still living in mud huts, now Himmler is starting to dig them up. In reality, we have every reason to remain silent about this chapter of our past. From the mid-1930s, Himmler's scientists scour the world for vestiges of the lost master race. They base their belief on Austrian engineer Hans Herbiger's theories. He claims that the Earth repeatedly traps planets from outer space, which then orbit before crashing to Earth. Great disasters result, as Herbiger's calculations prove. This is the cause of the end of the mythical island of Atlantis, home to the original master race. Survivors are said to have scattered across the globe. Himmler has this belief declared official Ahnenerbe teaching. He overturns conventional wisdom. His smart new historians dismiss feeble old theories. The film Germans or Pharaohs makes the master race master builders. Ich behaupte auch, diese große Pyramide ist das älteste Bauwerk der Erde überhaupt. Ihr Alter beziffert sich nicht auf die lächerlichen 4.800 Jahre, die die Ägyptologen anhand von unsicheren Angaben errechnet haben. Ihr Alter muss nach Zehntausenden von Jahren beziffert werden und reicht für eine ferne, ferne Zeit zurück zu einem Kulturvolk, das lange vor den Pharaonen lebte und ein Wissen besaß. Die Geschichtsforschung weiß nichts von einem solchen Kulturvolk und muss derartige Angaben als Fantastereien zurückweisen. Behind Stonehenge, behind every other great edifice of the past, lies the unseen hand of a Germanic architect. Arnon Erber research will prove it everywhere. Himmler, of course, also had an interest in uh, finding the old uh, uh, island of Atlantis, and that would 
necessitate an expedition uh, to perhaps Iceland or perhaps South America or, or Africa. So um, the power of expeditions was uh, very much in order by 1939-40. The SS Ancestral Heritage Organization plans an ambitious range of journeys. Researchers will be sent to Iceland to find further proof of the realm in the north of the vanished Aryans. But the master race had dispersed across the globe. Archaeologists would also be sent to disinter Aryan remains in the Middle East. A huge team of language experts would be dispatched to discover remnants of the Aryan language in North Africa. A large caravan of specialists and the differences between peoples would leave for the Caucasus in search of further ancestors of the master race in Asia. The ambitious agenda of the Arnon Erba even includes a journey to Amazonia. As early as 1935, a small team of German scientists comparing racial characteristics explores a tributary. Himmler is fascinated by the film they bring back. The pursuit of the survivors of Atlantis spreads right across South America. At Lake Titicaca, they find striking ruins. In the design, SS researcher Edmund Kiss distinguishes inner discipline. In his opinion, the finely built walls could only have been constructed by a people far superior to indigenous South Americans. His claims reject the scientific findings of the time. Pottery from the 8th century he confidently asserts to be 14,000 years old. But Kiss is not a scientist at all. He's a popular novelist. In Germany, however, his theories are welcome. But the ultimate proof of the master race will be sought not only in the highlands of the Andes, but in the high Himalayas. Here, according to SS dogma, survivors of the last cosmic catastrophe took shelter. This is the true cradle of the Aryan race. From the middle of the 18th century, Tibet was a closed land, forbidden to foreigners. A mere handful of explorers had returned with exotic travelers' tales. Now it is to become the destination of the first ever official German expedition to the very roof of the world. A hand-picked team of Nazi scientists will solve the final mystery. In pre-war Germany, popular interest in Tibet is triggered by the Swedish traveler Sven Hedin. He fails to reach Lhasa, but his exploits excite the public. It is the last frontier. Between the two world wars, an English officer once said in a speech to the Royal Geographical Society in London, the aeroplane has been invented, the world is now known, there are no more blanks on the map, there is nothing left to discover. However, he went on, one last mystery remains, and that is the land on the roof of the world, ruled by a god-king with hundreds of thousands of monks, where people can travel out of body. They meditate in caves, carve open corpses, and marry many wives or many husbands. The mystery attracts the ambitious young adventurer Ernst Schaefer, he recognizes his chance to reach Tibet courtesy of the Ananeba, the SS foundation to research ancestral heritage. He'd already been on two expeditions with uh, an American explorer called Brooke Dolan, when, where he had entered Tibet from the east, from the, by traveling up the Yangtze and entering Tibet from that direction. 
Uh, he had started writing about his experiences, and that had made him into a minor celebrity. And by becoming a minor celebrity, he came to the attention of Heinrich Himmler. And he seems to have appealed enormously to Himmler. He was a kind of German Indiana Jones, if you like, a brave adventurer. And Himmler wanted to collect him. He wanted to draw him into the SS and to add prestige to the SS activities. Schaefer's team sets out without entry visas, gambling on German political pressure to get them through. Industrialists fund the cost of the project generously. The total bill runs to 112,000 Reichsmarks, a million and a half pounds today. They leave Genoa for India, first stop Calcutta. From here they plan to travel via northern India to Tibet. In India, the British have every reason to be wary. German scientific expeditions have been used before as cover to launch uprisings. Already, Hitler's aggressive policies threaten to destabilize Europe. Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, is trying to avert catastrophe. As he was planning his expedition, Schaefer realized that he had an enormous problem. He needed to cross British India in order to reach Tibet. So he needed British permission to do that. Now, he and Himmler both knew that there were significant and powerful people in England who were sympathetic to Nazi Germany and didn't want a war with Germany. So Schaefer cultivated these people in London. He met them, he went to their meetings, he became friends with them. And he used them to put pressure on the British government to allow him to travel through British India. The British government acquiesces. They won't act over Hitler's rearmament or his invasion of Czechoslovakia. The climate of appeasement is of decisive importance for Ernst Schaefer's Tibet expedition. Fear of antagonizing Hitler infects even Asia. The Nazis are now thought to be too powerful to upset. Setting out from northern India, the expedition aims to cross the Himalayas, the highest mountain range on Earth. They will document their research with 60,000 photographs. They record their ambitious undertaking on 120,000 feet of film, over 50 hours. It's a desperate scramble. Landslides and torrents have to be overcome. The young SS officers are all scientists in the pay of the state. Ernst Krauser, botanist. Bruno Baker, anthropologist. Carl Wienert, geographer. It really was a cross-section of science in 1938 in Nazi Germany. And it shows what happens to science under a totalitarian government, what happens to the people who do science under a totalitarian government, and what happens to them when the totalitarian nature of that government becomes apparent and real. Their ornithologist and leader knows exactly what Himmler wants to hear. Schaefer announces that the goals of SS ideology and research are the same. Both are conducted by pioneers. Both make use of selection. Both are based on character and spiritual values given to us by our Germanic heritage. Privately, Schaefer sees Tibet as the place to practice his passion for hunting, collecting rare plants and animals. After a week-long pursuit, he bags his great prize, the previously unknown Sharpie. He also tracks down another mysterious creature. This is the land of the Yeti, the abominable snowman. Schaefer is the first to suggest that the Yeti is, in fact, a rare species of bear. His sceptical suggestion still convinces Himalayan explorers today.
Er hat äh, herausgefunden, dass zum Beispiel dort. He discovered that the Tibetan bear is a single species, which looks different depending how old it is or whether it is male or female. At the time, Russian and British experts claimed there were three types, the blue, the small snow bear, and the Tibetan bear. His single explanation is definitive and correct. Schaefer's discovery partly solves the Yeti mystery. But the explorer and zoologist finds himself increasingly drawn to the Tibetans themselves. He is fascinated by their magical world. The people believe in violent monsters and bloodthirsty demons. In the Tibetans, he glimpses a warlike past. The expedition film lingers on the figure of Mahakala, the Tibetan god with the headdress of skulls. Wild, proud, invisible Mahakala, you feast on mountains of corpses, you down oceans of blood with relish. The Skull and Crossbones is a representation of absolute power over life and death, as worn on every SS cap. Now the expedition must live up to its sponsor's expectations. For the five men are hoping to fulfill a great dream, to reach Lhasa, the legendary capital of Tibet. There they will find the highest nobles and perhaps exert some political or military influence. En route, Schaefer has established friendly ties with the British political officer, Sir Basil Gould. However, His Majesty's emissary in last year is a declared enemy of Nazi Germany. The reason for this is that the British had a very protective view of Tibet. They viewed it as a buffer, a, a kind of protection zone between the British Raj, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, and the powers to the north, China and Russia. They certainly didn't want representatives from a powerful European country coming to this country. The SS officers have not forgotten their primary mission, to collect evidence of common German-Tibetan roots. A research objective pursued, above all, by Schaefer's colleague, Bruno Bega. Bruno Bega was the expedition's anthropologist. He was a member of the SS, and he was fascinated by race theory, um, how you find out the differences between different races, and in his view, what made a particular race superior or inferior. Uh, he was fully committed to this ideology and intended to pursue that scientifically by traveling to Tibet. To recruit volunteers for his studies, the SS man offers free medical treatment. At home, he has drawn up criteria for forcible sterilization in order to eliminate unworthy life. As an anthropologist, Bega is interested in living subjects. This is why he is here, to convert people to data, to search for signs of the Aryans among their proportions. His method also entails making facial casts for later comparison. More than 200 subjects are recorded. They little suspect they are taking part in a scientific experiment that will end in mass murder. The Nazis' ideal of a pure Aryan type from which they descend was supported by the German science of the day. The 1938 expedition is to find physical proof. Well, I suppose everyone has a rather clear idea of what an Aryan is. Um, you see images of Aryans throughout Nazi culture. These are tall, blonde, blue-eyed supermen. And it seems at first to be completely absurd that you would look for relatives of Aryans who look like this in the middle of Asia, especially on the roof of the world in the middle of Tibet. But this is what the Tibet expedition was going to do. It was going to find connections between these peoples who seem so different. Behind this is a very complex theory that essentially suggests that long ago, 
there was a magnificent Nordic or Aryan civilization that was so superior, so talented, that it founded an enormous empire that spread across the world from Europe to Asia as far as Japan. When this empire collapsed, it left behind traces of its presence in the peoples in these far-flung parts of the world. Including Tibet, especially among the country's nobles, they are supposed to preserve Aryan heritage at its most pure. The expedition anthropologist Bager is keen to find evidence that links to the original Aryans. His cast-making risks the whole expedition. On his first attempt, he emits straws to breathe through. The victim has a panic attack and narrowly escapes death by suffocation. Silence has to be bought with a bribe. Nevertheless, Bega eventually produces a collection of Tibetan heads. Faces, he believes, conceal the characteristics of the Aryan super race. To prove this, he records anatomical details to enable him to compare them with the measurements of northern Europeans, supposedly the closest of all descendants of the Aryans. Bega uses the standard objective methods of German anthropology. He reduces hundreds of Tibetans to numbers. He even classifies the shade of their eyes and skin. Making these measurements was only really the starting point for Bega. He then had to process all these figures he had accumulated. Now, by doing that, he would, in a sense, boil them down and use the result to find out whether people were different or similar, related or not related. It's not that different from genetics, really. Modern genetics does almost the same thing with um, various kinds of genetic markers. But for Bega, it came down to mathematics. It was really the mathematics of the master race. Ahead lay Lhasa and its secrets. In January 1939, they ride through the Western Gate. The strangers aroused curiosity. Very few Europeans had ever set foot inside this closed world. Krauser, the cameraman, is fascinated by everyday scenes resembling life in medieval Europe. The strangers move within the realm of the God King, Retting Rinpoche. Schaefer sets out to win over the Tibetan leaders. The expedition members master the complicated rules of Tibetan etiquette. They discover they have much in common. We came as ambassadors of mutual understanding. Since the swastika is also the highest and most sacred symbol for us Germans, our visit is an example of the meeting of Western and Eastern swastikas in friendship and peace. At an audience at the Tibetan court, Schaefer receives a letter addressed to His Highness Mr. Hitler, King of the Germans. May you be blessed with physical well-being, with serene peace and good deeds. Greetings from the divine ruler to the Führer in Berlin. In the powerful Tibetan aristocracy, Schaefer sees a role model for a political system in Germany. They are ahead of all the rulers on this earth in that they are real kings, absolute leaders, often violent, but usually just. Their way of life is proud and manly. Schaefer describes Tibetan horsemen as models for elite SS troops, an idea that would appeal to Himmler. But Schaefer spends much time absorbing Tibetan religion. Fifty years later, he still has vivid memories of witnessing a shaman predict the future. Suddenly, he changed color. His face went first yellow and pale. 
Dann blutrot. Then blood red. Im frenetischen Tanz. He danced frenetically before collapsing in a heap, in a fit on the ground. Holy Lamas came and carried him back to the palace in his golden litter. When I spoke to him, he was fully conscious again, and he said, the flying people will come. There will be vast destruction. The electric spark will come to Laza that will wipe out our religion. And terrible things will happen in your countries. To the English and Germans in England and Germany. Something terrible does happen. In September 1939, German divisions attack Poland. The Second World War begins. Himmler recalls his men. The return of the German Tibetan expedition is a triumph. The knowledge they have acquired will feed the divisive and elitist racial theories propounded by the SS. But Schaefer's mind is already back in Tibet. Schaefer devises a scheme to begin a guerrilla war against British India, using the Tibetan army led by 30 SS men. The project is little more than an excuse to return to the Himalayas. The plan is spiked by the German army. Himmler has other plans for his Indiana Jones. Over the next three years, Schaefer and Krauser work on the footage they brought back. The account of the expedition is turned into Secret Tibet, the propaganda story of a warrior nation that allowed itself to be weakened and corrupted by religion. The parallel with Judeo-Christianity would not be lost on the German audience. A proud people are said to sink into criminality and degradation. Meanwhile, Himmler's Ancestral Heritage Foundation is engaged in its most demanding mission. Just as in Tibet, scientists from the Anan Erba are looking for traces of Aryan Germanic traditions. But this time, the SS men are searching on their own doorstep in the mountains of the South Tyrol. After World War I, the region, with its German-speaking population, had been occupied by Italy. After Mussolini seized power, the fascists increasingly oppressed the German minority. The South Tyroleans look to Hitler to free them, but he has quite different plans. He needs Mussolini's army. He will recognize the existing borders and move out the populace. Hitler commissions Himmler to resettle German speakers. The Arnon Erbe moves into offices in South Tyrol to organize the resettlement of about 200,000 people. To cope with the immense task, Himmler turns to the young man he has appointed director of the Arnon Erbe, Wolfram Zivis. The 32-year-old is an SS high flyer, able and ambitious, he has well-honed bureaucratic and administrative skills. Zivers was able to pull the strings. It didn't take him very long. He was a, he was a great organizer, and he was a, a good person to attract money. And uh, He was a very charming man. He was a good-looking guy, and uh, it didn't take him very long to play the key role in the Iron Lab. Zivers' staff collects thousands of questionnaires, they meticulously document the entire folklore of the South Tyrol. They record more than 24 hours of film. It is the biggest and most expensive operation carried out by the Arnon Erbe. The culture preserved by the SS is to form part of the baggage of those being resettled to be unpacked again when they reach their new homes. 
German tanks roll into the Soviet Union. The South Tyroleans are meant to follow. The Nazis' aim is to create a land where members of the German master race rule over millions of Russian slave laborers. In Himmler's eyes, the Russian prisoners of war are only material to be exploited. More and more will come under their yoke as the Germans press forward. The Arnhem Erbe continues its researches. At one institute, housed in an idyllic castle, the anthropologist Bruno Baker is now working on his Himalayan material. He decides to compare the Tibetan measurements with other races, with data derived from death. Hitler orders his soldiers to shoot the Jewish commissars of the Red Army on sight. Baeger intends to study their skulls to be sent back to Germany for his anatomy collection. During the war, uh, Bruno Baeger, who was the expedition anthropologist, was able to continue his scientific work. And as well as Asian populations that he'd studied in Tibet, he now added Jewish people to his studies. Baeger visits Auschwitz in search of what he calls suitable material. Organizational difficulties scupper plans to collect the heads of Jewish commissars on the Eastern Front. In Auschwitz, he selects over a hundred prisoners. They will be sacrificed for the sake of scientific comparison. In a sense, for him and for the Nazis, these were the antithesis of the Aryans who he had been looking for in Tibet. By becoming involved in this project, he eventually became involved in murder. In the summer of 1943, Vega's chief, Zivas, is able to report... In total, 115 persons have been processed for the further processing of the individual's immediate transfer to the Natzweiler concentration camp as required. At the Natzweiler camp near Strasbourg, the men and women selected by Beger are put to death. His colleague, August Hert, professor of anatomy at Strasbourg University, a member of the Ananerba, personally chooses the chemicals to gas the prisoners. Subsequently, he receives the bodies for further processing. The Ananerba scientists intend to create a comprehensive collection of skeletons. When the French liberate Strasbourg, they find 16 entire corpses and parts of 70 others at the university. At the fronts, the German troops are withdrawing. At home, the Allies raise towns and cities to the ground. The Arnenerbe decamps from the ruins of Berlin to the South German provinces. The picturesque village of Weichenfeld becomes the new base for Wolfram Sievers. The Arnenerbe administrator is now heavily involved in corrupt experiments. He collaborates on tests being carried out at Dachau concentration camp, military scientific applied research for the German Air Force. With Ziva's connivance, prisoners become expendable test objects. They're made to undergo the sudden loss of pressure at high altitudes. Nazi doctors simulate conditions up to a height of 13 miles. The experiments cause unbearable pain. Half of the 150 die. Tibet cameraman Ernst Krauser is supposed to film this. His colleague, Ernst Schaefer, goes to see one of the experiments. He stops Krauser from going. His motives remain obscure. In May 1945, the Third Reich is finally done for. Allied troops arrive with plans to hunt down war criminals. 
those who do not surrender go into hiding or attempt to escape. Heinrich Himmler tries to flee. British soldiers recognize him and take him prisoner. Whilst they search him, he bites on a cyanide capsule and dies immediately. Now the master race and its murderous policies stand accused of crimes against humanity. In Nuremberg, one of the biggest war trials in history unfolds. In the dock, scientists and researchers sit alongside prominent Nazis. But of all the staff in Himmler's Annenerbe, only one man, the director, Wolfram Sievers, is charged. The reason why it was only Wolfram Sievers who was actually indicted was that he was the link between the indictable offenses of the Annenerbe, which were the experiments on prisoners and Jews in two concentration camps, at least two, uh, and, uh, and Annenerbe operations. Uh, there was really nothing else that was criminal which the Annenerbe did. The administrator of the fatal experiments is caught by his pedantic correspondence. Marked secret. It's addressed to Brandt, Himmler's adjutant. It's your letter witness, isn't it? It's your signature at the bottom of it. Jawohl. I'll read it out. Following the subsequently induced death of the Jew, whose head should not be damaged, the delegate will separate the head from the body and will forward it to its proper point of destination in a hermetically sealed tin can, especially produced for this purpose and filled with a conserving fluid. Wolfram Sievers, Military Tribunal 1 has found and adjudged you guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, for your said crimes on which you have been and now stand convicted. Military Tribunal 1 sentences you, Wolfram Sievers, to death by hanging, and may God have mercy upon your soul. The officer of the guard will remove the defendant, Sievers. Despite appeals by international scientists, Sievers suffers the fate of the guilty. Fifteen years later, a younger Michael Cater starts a search for the survivors of the Arnenerbe. He interviews the expedition leader, Ernst Schaefer. He and I had a very good chat, uh, and even when I broached some of, of the more delicate issues such as don't you think there may have been murder at play uh, during that planned exhibition to Tibet? Don't you think that one or, one or two of your friends might have endeavored to kill certain people? He didn't exclude the possibility. For his grand dream of Tibet, Ernst Schaefer had aligned himself with murderers. After the war, he pays the price. His valuable collection of Tibetan artifacts is scattered among various museums. Although he is never convicted of any crimes, his SS past prevents him gaining the celebrity he craved. He dies in 1992. In the mid-1960s, trials of those involved at Auschwitz begin. While tracing evidence and tracking down perpetrators, the public prosecutors stumble across Bruno Baeger. He is living quietly in Frankfurt. Michael Kater goes to see him. He has some hard questions to put to him. He was, uh, he was extremely adamant in, in, uh, in maintaining that he had committed no crime. I mean, he was, he was uh, understanding of my mission, of my, uh, of my job, which was to write a PhD dissertation and do the research for it, but, 
but he would have none of any accusations that were being labeled at him at at the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt at the time when I visited him, that he uh, that he be uh, branded as a as a killer. In 1971, Bruno Beger received a three-year prison sentence as accomplice to murder. Today, he is alive and well in a small town in Germany. Other members of the Ahnenerber staff were never charged. The documents and film footage disappeared into archives. And with them vanished the memory of an extraordinary undertaking. It was the high point of the fatal quest to make myth modern history. By joining the SS, were the Ahnenerbe members proving their adherence to Nazi ideas of racial purity? Or were they overambitious men seeking a shortcut to success in their fields? After the war, they would claim they were scientists, nothing more. But a technical defense cannot absolve them from their lasting moral guilt.